wish you all and welcome you all to this uh, session, fifth session of the first day of uh, the convention. In this session, our guest speaker for this special lecture is Sri N. C. Krishna. Sri N. C. Krishna joined the Theosophical Society at a very young age when he was only 16. He is uh, qualified professionally as a chartered accountant though he was interested in joining our community that is uh, the community of teachers. He wanted to become a lecturer in English. But uh, Destiny took him to chartered accountants. He is now settled in Hyderabad. He owes everything to his maternal grandfather, who, by this example, inspired him to join the Theosophical Society. He is uh, trying to lead a life based on Theosophical principles sincerely. He is a national lecturer of Theosophy, executive committee member of the Indian section Theosophical Society. Today, he will be sharing his views on the topic, Brotherhood, is it a fact or myth? So, without taking much of your time, I would invite Sri N. C. Krishna to the dais and share his views on a very important topic in the current scenario, in the contemporary times when we are facing and see a lack of brotherhood. So, the last question is whether brotherhood is a fact or it is something. So I welcome Professor N. C. Krishna. He was inspiration for me to inspiration. He didn't ask me to 
join? And I asked, can I join? Are you sure you want to join? He asked me. So I said, take a day and come back. So I took, took a day and went back to him and said, the are to join. He then signed it as died. In those days we had that, because we left and we were asked to be. That became the form had to be signed by the guy. So that was how it was. And uh, by virtue of the fact that we were giving it idea, thanks to his giving it idea, we were giving it idea, I met a lot of people who were practical examples of people who were living things off their life. For example, the Lenny Prina. And uh, I had interaction with Madame Yente Hoskins then General Secretary of the English section. So once we walked into the convention restaurant, that's where a real convention used to take place that right year because the number of people who gathered there, so the entire set of people who have come are present in the uh, Adia Theatre or not, but the convention restaurant used to be full of this. So she walked in there and she said, what is that I need? I thought speaking English at that point of time rather fast was the in thing. So I was told like that. So when I said, Italy, Masala Dosa, Onion Dosa, can you say that slowly? I said, a bit slowly. No, still slowly. Then I said, out of frustration, Italy, Masala Dosa, Onion Dosa. I said it so slowly. Oh, that's it, that's all it is. I know to speak English in a different way, you know, for it. But that's not the thing. We have to communicate well. Are you a speaker in your college? I said, yes, I participate in the debates. I try to finish the content in about seven minutes or eight minutes the time given for us to finish. Oh, that's the reason what we have to speak. So it's quite possible. Then she taught us how to speak in public. Then they must And what a knowledge and what a person she was. I know a lot of people have gone to the commentary which she has written, the poem of the sacred doctrine. And uh, she taught us the rudiments of public speaking. Even if you don't have a mind, ensure the last person sitting, he should listen to the last syllable of your word. That's what she used to say. And she told us how to go about decoding the topic. Decoding the topic. So this topic is something which I have chosen when Mahabharata Ji asked me whether who is it a fact or a myth. So I will go the way she talked, decoding the topic to the way she talked it. So how do you understand this term fact? The synonym for this word fact is truth. So we can say that fact is a content which we all know as truth. So, fact is that one which is real, the fact is one which is actual, fact is one which is certain. More importantly, we stand to the test of time. The truth remains true whether it is said so many centuries ago or not. So it stands to the test of time. That's true. And Krishna you was once asked, what is truth? Yes, man, you can't talk about it. Just should meditate on it. Then he came back and said, You should be ready to die for that. That's true. Oh, you are all quite impressed with the way he said it, the way he pronounced it. You should be able to die for that. That's true. Right. And then, as an apprentice of Charity Conferency at Lovelock and Lewis, there was an occasion where I was goaded by one of my co apprentices to speak a lie, to utter a lie. And the office closed on Friday, it opens on Monday. So Saturday, Sunday, I was not comfortable. So my grandfather noticed all that and said, What's the problem you have? Why are you not talking at home? I said, There's a problem, there's a dilemma you have. Dilemma, tell me, is there something which we can do together? And then I said, My colleagues want me to utter a lie, so it's a punishment. And the person who supervised my work went ahead of me, reached Madras before me and said something which is not true. So my colleagues say that I should put him in a spot by uttering the lie. So this is the problem. <coughs> then my grandfather said, 
you live life goes why should you have a life punishment is not your sin you will live life goes why should you live so it's something similar to what krishna ji said it is something which you can't talk about or something for which you should die so this is the lesson which i learned when i was this second lesson i learned when i was 19 the first lesson i learned when i was 14 so i have been practicing that thanks to those two great people in my life right thanks to the founders the founders which is our god and and the last week they were starting the model was they went to ishakapatnam they went to vijayanagaram the king of vijayanagaram who is called pusala family this pusala is a surname in the king was related to the king of banaras here so he gave an introduction letter to man class the all what they did get that had that in their hand they came visited king of banaras who welcomed them and went in they saw that on the plate such a nasty parotta and madam laski said can we take this and do it in our peer talk with the society right yes this is from mahabharata anybody can take it shanti parva mahabharata anybody can take it you can have so that's how we have that such a nasty parotta that must be have translated there's no religion i will choose dharma we call it as truth so that's how we have acquired that motto is no that reason i am true and true is not just indicating our ability not to utter a lie it's not our ability to say i don't lie that's not true truth is much more so it includes love it includes <coughs> prema or love is prema compassion karuna tolerance nidiksha as they call it in sanskrit and so many facets of truth are there to make the world true pregnant with a lot of meaning various shades of meaning but the string of this book it writing the exact shade of meaning to the word the concept which was when was very ancient at least in krishna ji's talk we could hear um uh, oh some 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 of the times in us but in sri ram's talk it used to be a continuous flow and hara used to be a continuous thing not a single occasion i have heard i have heard number of lectures never i have heard him searching for words or using a question like sort of no you never use that exact word used to and i asked my grandfather how is this he just to be able to talk so precise he says this from the pythagorean school was a mathematician then mathematician even now in this way so that's true so i just tell you bit of tidbits of what i know during my growing days growing years at the face of the society and the word religion etymologically speaking means binding us together binding us together so that's dharma that is religion but the today at present we use that in the same connotation is a more point we don't know whether it's binding us together or dividing us it all depends on individual's choice yes we feel sometimes something like a feel that the watch here and we touch something it is something i know which is real tangible and that i say is a fact this is a watch i say because i i know it truth like love and maybe the word brotherhood is not something which is tangible it's not tangible you can feel it but it's not tangible and uh, i will talk about fact what is a myth we often relate this word myth to a story from the past times myth is related to story of the past times in india especially it can be a story about gods i'm saying gods because it's more deep gods a myth could be around a place around a place the holy place we call it it is said in our part the south indian part that there are thirty three crores of devas are going in these people pray to get their whatever they want so devotees are there for 33000 crores various names various forms it is one place called mangalagiri mangalagiri shuha giri is a hill and there is 
Lord Narasimha is there in the Gira. Mangal King, Lord Narasimha is there in the Gira. Whatever you give, he gives 50 percent back. Suppose I pour jaggery mixed water into his mouth, one glass, I'll get half glass of prasad. And I put one container, big container into his mouth, I'll get half. This is the mystery of the place, and people used to say that's the good uh, Mahima of that God. So people used to go flock to the temple. And there was a myth around that place. Kids are standing. They said it is an architectural wonder which was created by a silk. Because that's not something which has happened, Mulamira, or something which has come on its own, it was not that. It was not something which happened by way of the structure or the way the sculpture was done. So it is not Swayam Bhu, as they call it. Swayam Bhu is something which has happened like that without anybody's intervention. So myth is an idea or a story which many believed, which many believed to be true and eventually they understood. It's perhaps not true. It gained currency because people believed it true and one said to another, another said to another. That's how it went about. Until a scientific revelation perhaps broke that and busted that. So that's how we understand myth. Now we are asking brotherhood, brotherhood for which the Theosophical Society stands. And it stood for about 146 years and perhaps this is the 147th year. I don't think there is any other spiritual organization which is so, so old. So, 147 years old working for the upliftment of humanity. So, this is the face of the society and uh, we wonder and still want to examine the concept of the universal brotherhood because we are yet to experience the reality we are only talking about it. We say sometimes brother, but is there brotherliness going through me, going from my heart to the other person? That's more real and more important. At this stage, at this stage, I would like to share the contents which appeared in the Canadian Theosophist. Long back, I have a copy at home. I can place my hands to I rummage to my papers. I can Located, I would have brought it if somebody wanted to see it. But the Canadian Theosophist gave a story. It is said that the inner founders of the Theosophical Society, who were considered at that time the hierarchy as juniors, because the great white brotherhood has also, they also have a stages which they will climb. So these two were considered as juniors, the inner founders, and they approach their hierarchs in the order and they sought permission to conduct an experiment on humanity. And what is that experiment? To introduce this concept of brotherhood. So they had this in mind. And so they went and talked to their seniors and uh, what the seniors said, yes the idea is good, without distinctions we should form the Humanity will be one, but the time is not right. That's what they said. That was in much before 1875. So, again, after some time, they approached again because they were quite willing to conduct their experiment once again. They went and approached the hierarchy and they said, Yes, you can do it after all, but you can't participate directly into that movement by yourselves. You can choose your representatives. So, that's how it is said. We have got NSD Norcott and HP Blavatsky as their representatives and they themselves, they have admitted, they are perhaps not the best, but the best among the available. So if you can understand what NSD Norcott was took so much of, it took so much of trouble in trying to propagate theosophy and Madame Blavatsky was asked by her guru when she met her in the Hyde Park in 1851. There will be a lot of problems before we are going to talk about truth. We are going to pervade truth. Are you prepared to face all the criticism which will be heaped against you? She said, yes, I will take care of it. And she went through, and what all she went through, of course, we know the history says all that. So, 
Finally, saying bit is an idea until it is proved otherwise, it's called myth. So, this experiment resulted in our founders, which is all about and Madame Blavatsky, starting this movement in 1875. They reached both from different directions in 1873 to New York and they went to those places called Chittendale where the experiments were happening in spiritualism. And finally, 1875, November 17, along with 15 others, these two and William Paul Judge, they formed the East Oxford Society. But this story finds place in the book written by Michael Holmes, I do not know. But this is a story or an essay, I would say, an article which I read in the Canadian Theosophist. Right? The word brotherhood, we have talked about fact, we have talked about myth. The word brotherhood is actually means coming together, coming together for the purpose of feeling brotherly, with deep compassion, love and understanding. We used to have this question and answer session during Sri Ram's time too. Sri Ram used to be in the centre, he would answer some questions, he used to be panel. Family used to answer the questions. There was one youngster who was known to me, and uh, he posed a question, he sent a question. A, a, he thought it's a mysterious question, they find it very difficult to answer. The, the question was at the internet convention, how can you practice brotherhood with your wife? That was the question. And the question went to Mr. Samuel Barrow. That time with a senior theologist, which people of my generation would know him. He used to walk in Adia and he used to come to Adia to conduct the Z School of the Wisdom. Incidentally, Madam P.M.P. Hoskins also had come to be the director of the School of the Wisdom. There were two Z's when Mr. Jinnala Jatasa started the School of the Wisdom in 1949. He said very clearly, it is the wisdom and it is the only school. That's why the school of the wisdom. These days, school of wisdom, school of wisdom, people say it is not that. It is the school of the wisdom. So it's a very interesting uh, composition of words. And uh, this is how this question was answered so beautifully by Samuel Ballard. And uh, he said, if we have a lot of understanding, if we can really care for her, you can show a lot of concern for her. You can be brotherly. Not necessarily brotherly doesn't mean being sister and brother. Not that. But you can be showing a concern, care, affection. Then you can be brotherly. This person who is pushing himself to the edge of the seat to listen to the answer was pressed for. He was not quite happy with the answer. But that is the real answer. Because brotherly, being brotherly, that's important. It starts from home. After all, charity begins at home. So, being that considerate with the person who is sharing your life, I think that's very, very important. <coughs> so, let us say, brotherhood is feeling brotherliness. One of the senior members of the Faith of the Society is not amongst us now. He passed away on 26th of January. He used to speak this word, brother, brother, B-R-O-T-H-E-R. He would draw a line at B-R and put B-R, other. So if you remove the B-R, we become other. So otherliness is what we practice, not brotherliness, he used to say. Because B-R stands for Brahman. Brahman means Parabrahman. If you remove Parabrahman, if you drop Parabrahman, you become other. So we don't see the other person as Parabrahman's representative. So we behave differently. So this is what the gentleman who passed away, Dr. NCR, used to talk about. Brotherly, draw a line, idea. These two words can they have a different meaning when you understand differently. And otherly is what we all know. But if we add the Brahman, we become brotherly. If we remove the Dia, we become otherly. This is what he used to say. And so true. So true because we don't 
really consider that the person is as well informed as I am. I know, he also knows, is something which we don't want to grant. I know, the other man doesn't know, is what we think. So this is the problem. So actually, coming to the means understanding for the purpose of for the purpose of this practice in your brother and sister for the world. So that care, that compassion. I'm repeating this words care, compassion, love, purposefully. It's a lot of intent. And that's the reason why we are here. The theme seems to be that universal brotherhood. So when you observe, this is what we are supposed to do in brotherly. And when we observe the nature, we see that it comes from for all of us, it cares for all of us. And even when we damage or imbalance the nature, as it was mentioned in the morning by Professor Roy, Ajay Kumar. So even when you damage it, still it cares for you. It doesn't say that you are finished, but it allows it to carry on. So nature is something, it cares for us. And uh, if you take the example of the river, which is always flexible, look at the river Ganges, it starts from somewhere, Gambo 3, they say, and the river touches so many places, so many people's lives it touches, and the river is flexible, touches so many narrow passages, so many wider places, so some hard terrain, some soft places, so it goes on, works around the limitations. That's the river. So the river is not rigid, it's flexible. It doesn't find fault, even when someone is using it not for bathing or drinking for some other purpose. These days if you go to the ritual, you don't really can't, can't take a tip because it's so so dirty. Because we have got the capability of making anything dirty. So even canvas has been made into a dirty place there. So are we flexible, caring, understanding, even when the other person is not saying with us. Yes, a lot of times the other person doesn't say it with us. Can we be more understanding, more with a lot of love and concern? Can we be that? So this is the real test of brotherhood. If you can hang the portrait of the person or a photograph of the person who is differing with you, I'm just giving an example, you can even imagine. If you can hang the portrait or photograph of the person before you and still love that person every time you see, because that person you are Reminding, oh, this person doesn't go along with me, but then are you showing love towards him? Are you sending your good thoughts to him? That could change him. But instead, if I talk about, oh, he doesn't say anything, he doesn't agree with me, that would only aggravate that differences and you would still feel different with us. So this is what the real test of brotherhood is to see that we can be flexible, we need not be rigid, we can be understanding. We can say to those people who do not after all say with us. This is the most important. Be accommodative. We can keep everyone. I, I purposely made it very simple. I thought I kept these people in mind, these youngsters in mind. Last night when I was jotting down the points, last afternoon when I was jotting down the points. So I don't see them, but anyway, I have to complete the process. So sharing, loving, being compassionate from within, from within, I'm repeating this word from within, genuinely, that is brotherliness. So we can say that is brotherhood. Nature gives us a mango tree and it doesn't choose to whom to give, whom not to give. Everybody can have it. Anybody who can reach the fruit, he has it. So when we give without choice, when we give without choice, with no expectations, there is bound to be happiness and brotherhood. So when we take a leaf out of the book of nature, we know when we take a leaf out of the nature, nature's book, we know what then why do you feel otherly? Because we use the word otherly sometimes back. Why do you feel otherly, not brotherly? Again, this is because imagine that we are a bottle, we are a bottle. There is a cork on top of it, not allowing anything to come out. So if you imagine our heart to be a bottle and we have put a cork on top of it, 
breath awareness is not, is not flowing out, the vapors are not coming out, the thoughts are not coming out. So the thought, the lid is our selfishness. The image we have formed about our lips, let us say, I have an administrative power, say for example in my office, which I used to have, I was the chief of the organization. Doesn't matter whatever you are, but how do you friendly with everybody? Even the gardener should feel gardener who only has the ability to look after his plants, he should feel I, I can approach him, I can go across to him, I can talk to him. So that's sort of an openness when we practice, I think we can practice brotherhood. So I don't know whether we have this intention of practicing this brotherhood because we just mechanically move. We don't move with <coughs> thinking. So sometime back, the same topic was there. We react, we don't act. For acting, we need contemplation. For reacting, we don't need contemplation. We only need our something which is immediately react. Instead of reacting, we are acting. And acting that you are some sort of a thought, whether I should say this, I should not say this. It's a fact, but still, should I say it? Because there is the usual Sanskrit saying that I don't want to quote Sanskrit, but what is real, if it is causing the other man trouble, don't say it. Don't say it is the word the saying. And are we humble? Do we have the clarity to say, I am brotherly? And can we be humble? Because humility brings simplicity. Simplicity will put us in touch with divinity. Actually, given a chance, we would like to talk about our achievements. We will advertise ourselves, our abilities. Driving all these image building exercises, doing all these image building exercises, we are practicing as the Yaku Dubey was talking in the morning, exclusiveness and giving up, sharing and not showing concern, love and compassion. So we are bereft of inclusiveness. So it comes back to the same point, the selfishness which has become part of us, which has come a long way with us. And how do we get rid of it? So Krishna Ji says observe it, observe it and drop it. It's not just, it doesn't go away like that. So we are also given by HPV a, a way in which we can observe ourselves, self-observation during the night before we retire. So if we observe ourselves like an outsider or another person is looking at me, thoroughly, then I can drop. At least where all the places where I allow my selfishness to crop up, I can eliminate that. So this exercise has been followed in the Pythagorean school. She borrowed it from the Pythagorean school and gave it to us. So this self-introspection which she talks about is something which we can practice. To practice the way in which we can live with contemplative way. Living which is full of love. So can we do work for the sake of work? Or we still say, I have done it and lean back in the chair so that it breaks. So can we do work for work's sake? And history talks about this in the first fundamental principle. And then we all come from that one source. And that source is something which we can't define. She quotes Madhya Bhupanish and says, Avarchyam and Achinchyam. She says that. I'm saying for the first time, somebody in Sanskrit, I can't speak about it. I can't think about it, I can't grasp it. That's what she said in the first fundamental proposition. We didn't come from that source. All of us belong to that source. Not only we human beings, but all the living beings, all the living beings come from that source and we come back to that, go back to that source. So that communion which we are trying, the individual soul to merge with the universal soul, if that is the obligatory journey. And we keep coming back till that obligatory journey is not complete. We keep, keep coming back because all these imperfections which are coming to our life have to be set aside, dropped permanently. And then perhaps we we'll go towards the universal soul.
So when we leave, when we live, or when we leave, I said, a meditative life, a contemplative life, and function with love in our heart, with care and concern, compassion for others, other living beings, we all can be brotherly and say very confidently, brotherhood is a fact and not a myth. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, explaining the idea of brotherhood and uh, you explain it like a scientist because we had three words here, brotherhood, fact and myth. And uh, we could see that uh, you explained all these three words step by step. Because action 
action acting needs contemplation and uh, we usually do not do that shri krishna also explained how brotherliness can build a better society and how we can get rid of selfishness by inner observation or self introspection only then there will be a communion with the supreme universal soul so brotherhood is a fact it is only that we have to learn as to how to practice it <coughs> so we are very thankful to you for explaining this concept this idea to us and uh, we really feel heartfelt gratitude to you for taking your time out and speaking to us so on behalf of uh, our convention officer i would like to once again thank our guest speaker and all the audience all our uh, members of uh, from various parts of the country sitting here a very warm thanks to all of you